You are now listening to Durian ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing. Anything can happen Friday. The art and cultural site of Southeast Asia. Hi, this is Gauri. Hi, this is Grace. And you're listening to us on Durian ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing. And today is, of course, Anything Can Happen Friday, and we will be discussing about、uh, the music industry in Malaysia. That's correct. And when you talk about music industry or in general, we have invited a few speakers already at、right. ASEAN, and l- this person specifically,、mm-hmm. we're very looking forward to speaking to him for a long time, and finally he's here with us. That's right. And uh, we uh, today we have、uh, Mr. Isham Omar, who is the CEO of Primework Studios, and he has agreed to sort of enlighten us about the music industry <laughs> in Malaysia. So let's say good morning to him. Good morning. Good morning, guys. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. All right. Nice to you. So Isham, maybe we can start with a little introduction to yourself or a brief, brief background about your musical、uh, talents and your musical journey and how exactly you got involved in this. Oh, okay. Uh, that's gonna be a long <laughs> speech, but okay. No, I, I, at the age of three years old, my mother decided to wheel in an upright piano,、okay. and said that three that, years old. You know, wow! She, she said that you, you, you better learn this fast、right. because I want to sing the song of the Beatles. I want to <laughs> sing. I want to hold your hand. No. So please <laughs> learn this fast. So she sent me to Yamaha Music、yeah. School in the beginning, and I learned. I never knew. That、uh, I was actually gonna be a musician. I was、right. just gonna play this for fun, so that you know,、mm-hmm. she can sing. And every time there was like a raya gathering in my house, and、yeah. all all these foreigners, I don't know who they are in the house. <laughs> Is I'm playing the piano, so、mm. okay. But they got me out of washing the dishes, so I'm pretty okay with that. <laughs> I was pretty okay with that.、Uh, and then、um, I think、um, after SPM, I had、mm. a, a scholarship. In fact, I had a. Some scholarships to do things other than music. Okay.、Um, but, but on the way to pick up those scholarships, I, I bump into a woman. Her name is Helen Yap. Okay. Now Helen Yap is a well-known music arranger,、mm. and songwriter. And at that time, she was very famous for doing Sheila Majid's Antara Anjir dan Jakarta. So I was like starstruck. Wow. And I said,、um, she was at this music school,、mm-hmm. um, in Uptown Damansara. Uh, so I just decided to walk into the music school because、right. I saw Helen Yap and、mm. said,、uh, "Can I take up some clock courses?" And she, she basically I said, "Let's jam." So we did. Right.、Uh, and then after that, she said, "Hey, you should go to Berkeley." Yeah. So I thought if Helen Yap said I should go to Berkeley <laughs> College of Music, <laughs> I will go to Berkeley College of Music. I didn't know at that time. I thought、uh-huh. I was just gonna be like playing music for fun and、okay. making people happy. Maybe have a band, but at、mm. the same time, I'm gonna be like some, I don't know, economist or something. I'm not sure what it was. <laughs>、okay. So I,、uh, so what happened was that、mm. I told, went back. I didn't pick up the scholarship. In fact, I did pick up the scholarship, but I、right. said, "Do you have anything for music?"、Mm. The guy looked at me and said, "Are you nuts? <laughs> Are you? What's wrong with you? Get, get a control of your life. Get a grip、mm. of yourself. What are you doing music for?、Right. There's no money in it. Are you crazy?" I said, "Okay, never mind." I think I was thinking then there was a, a hundreds of people around me, and they were all、right. picking up scholarships for engineering, law,、mm-hmm. uh, economics.、Mm-hmm. And I thought I would just be one of them. Right. Nobody's doing music. I think I think I can be the sheriff. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I went back.、Um, I went back and I told my mom. And I I swear, she nearly fainted. <laughs> she was like, because she was thinking, what music?、Mm-hmm. Right. She knew I liked it.、Yeah. She knew I could play. But really, take it up as a thing. And then she said, where Where is it? I said, I said it's in Boston. Boston, like America. <laughs> yeah, not Boston. It's in Klang, ma. It's in America. So、uh, she said,、uh, she she, her face changed. Yeah. My dad was next to her, but her face changed, and she slumped down in the in the chair, and she was like, uh, uh, like well, that, right? Speechless. She was speechless, <laughs> and then suddenly she opened up her eyes and、mm. looked at me and said, "Okay, you know what? If you want to be、right. a tukang sapu sampah." Be the best tukang sabu sampah in the world. Wow!、Okay. I will support you.、Mm. Meaning that study, whatever it is,、okay. you know, do nuclear gardening. Yeah. Study it first. Just don't go dive into it. So become、right. the best that you can be. Okay. So, but I knew it was going to be tough for them, for、right. my parents, because there was no scholarship, and and Boston in America. Get、mm-hmm. okay, that time the exchange rate was only two point five. Yeah. <laughs> but still, still it was expensive. So in the end,、right. they they decided to、mm. sold the sold the car.、Uh, Okay. And I was very grateful for that. 
and um, they did a lot of things to just support me. Mm. And so I went um, and studied at Berkeley College of Music. Okay. Yeah. Did, did you have any other ambition? Like yeah, you wanted I, to be Batman? Or well, something? not really. When I was 15 years old, I kind of knew that I wanted to be some sort of music producer. Oh, okay. Right, like Quincy Jones. Oh, wow. Right, so I thought I wanted to be like that because yeah. I always thought when I listened to music, I said, hey, the drums should have been like that, or oh, the bass should have played this way. So I thought that sounds like a music production job thing, right. you know? so whatever it is. So I thought I would do that as, as well as, you know, do a degree in economics. Mm -hmm. I thought I could do both. But then I decided to go right jump into music. So when I was studying in Berkeley, I, I decided to take up uh, my major was music production. Mm -hmm. uh, then suddenly, halfway through, I got interested in the music business itself, right. making records, making a company that makes records. Mm -hmm. So then I studied that as well. And after that, I went and did my MBA that was strictly in uh, business. Oh, so okay. I took the both disciplines, came back mm -hmm. and kicked off a recording company called Positive Tone. Okay. And that was way back in 1994 when Gauri or Grace were not born yet. Oh, you never know. <laughs> Actually, I was four years old. You're, oh my God. Was, anyway, 1994. <laughs> So I kicked it off. Uh, we, 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 it was struggling at the first, right. from, from the beginning. Mm -hmm. It was really, really, really bad. But what inspired you to start it when the moment you came back and you were like, I'm sure you were thinking, how can yeah. I kick off this? I thought I was going to become a, a jingle producer because everybody ah. was making money doing jingles. Right, right. But then I was working in a punk recording company in Boston. Now they had bands like the Lemonheads, Mighty Mighty Boston's, really, really weird bands. There was a band called Zip Code Rapist. What? I know. Very clever name. But please don't call your band that. Right. Uh, so I, when I came back, um, I went to see this guy, Helen, again. Uh -huh. Helen introduced me to a guy called Kenny Tay. Kenny Tay of Kenny Remy Martin. It's an old group, right? He had a jingle house. So I went to see him and, and Helen said, hey, he also has this company called Positive Tone. Uh -huh. So I thought he meant that you know, Kenny was a guy who was very positive. But anyway, um, so I went there and Kenny said, hey, uh, I just got this label. I don't know what to do with it. Um, so I said, okay. Uh, he brought me to see a guy working in the back room called Paul Moss. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know Paul Moss is that judge, that judge the angry judge in yes. relation to yeah. <laughs> uh, secret is he's always angry. Ah. Yeah, yeah, he wasn't trying to be Simon Cowell. I think Simon Cowell was trying to be him. Okay. He's always angry. He's always upset. So he, I bumped into Paul and Paul said, hey, let me play you this. So he played this band called OAG. All right. It was the most simplest chords you can imagine. I don't think the, the Ruddy knew what chords he was playing, but he was just moving his fingers around right. and you can hear the melodies were coming out. It was really, it reminded me of Boston. Mm. I thought I never, could never find this kind of music. Right. So then I went to the gigs and looked at it. It was, it was a big crowd at the gigs. So there's something here. Um, so I told I went to Kenny and said I'm in, but let me make this independent kind of sound because I think right. there's no one is doing this right. right. That is a market. Mm. I'm thinking that is a market. Right? So I went to all the Warner Music and EMI and Universal and Polygram at that time. Met yeah. Tony Fernandez. Oh, I met okay. Lazib Baka. I met everybody, and they all didn't want to really help me because they thought you're crazy. This right. because I I showed them OAG. Mm. I said you are crazy. These guys are. A bunch of, uh, you know, mixed race guys mm. singing English music. They're only 16 year old. You know, right. there's no way it's going to sell. We never heard this kind of, what is this called? Alternative. Why is this alternative? It, it right. can't sell. So nobody wanted to help me. Mm. And I, in the end, I decided to figure out how to distribute it myself. Okay. Mm. So I went to a shop <laughs> in Ampang Park. Tried to get the guy to, can you uncle, can you put the CD please? Right. Can you put, can you just put, can you please, please? Sell for me. I only got one CD, one pressing, right? Please. Aww. And then the guy said that, you know what? He looked at me. Mm. And this is what he said verbatim. Mm. Uh, I always tell this and people always laugh, but this is true. Mm -hmm. He said, he looked at the CD. He looked, looked at the band and said, hey, Izam, uh, ini ya, uh, kedai saya, itu ah, uh, itu tempat, itu orang putih punya, itu orang Melayu punya, ini orang Cina punya. Ini orang Melayu sama orang Cina nyanyi lagu orang putih ya. Uh, mana saya mau letak? Uh, so he didn't know where to put because the music industry was structured right. into what was what was used to oh. you know what, what they were used to which means it, music has to be like that if you want to play the game go make a big mass market Malay record huh. go make a mass market Chinese record okay. or go make a, a something or if you want to be in English you have to yeah. go and live in the States right. so so there was no place for it okay. so we I was nearly about to give up 
mm-hmm. and I thought I told Paul, Paul, I think maybe we were too clever, because we were thought we could change Malaysia, we oh. could try and introduce something new, but then I remember the gigs, I remember the crazy feeling in the gigs, people jumping up and down, screaming their heads off, something's not right, the industry is just behind mm. the the consumer, right. then I realized as I go on in life, industry is always behind the consumers, mm. consumers always ahead, so yeah. I thought. We're just going to try. So we went and found an indip- independent distributor and we sold OAG through them. And I tell you, the thing just started moving by itself. Right. It was moving. The distributor was calling me and saying that I want I need another 500. I need another 500. And I was oh. struggling because it was just me and Paul and my brother. <laughs> trying. Of course, I had to pretend and say, I have a team. Oh. I will right, tell my right. team. But the team was just me and Paul and right, right. Uh, the younger brother would help me out. So, so, but we were, in the end, in three weeks, we sold 25,000. Okay. Wow. And then about six months it was fifty thousand. Mm-hmm. And of course, when I told uh, Tony Fernandez and Aziz Baka about it, they were like, uh, uh, "Which which album is this that sold fifty thousand?" Say, "Well, it's the one that you did not like." <laughs> and of course, they say, okay. "Of course, them being them, say, yeah, mm-hmm. if you follow our advice and made it all Malay, you sold three hundred thousand, you know." Uh, but that's just them. Jokingly, but, yeah. but it's jokingly. Right. But I think they were very happy because we created something new. Mm-hmm. So that was what positive was all about. Positive tone. Okay. So we did OAG. Then we went to. That was indie. Then we, I think we we started the indie movement in terms of making it commercial. Before there were a lot of other indie artists, but okay. OAG made it commercial. Then we did hip hop, mm. body ammo. After that, too fat and the innuendo yeah. for R and B and then right. Farhad and then Rafage and then V E and and all those guys. Okay. Yeah. So did you actually see this whole movement going on in your head when you came to Malaysia from Boston? Did not see. No. Yeah. I only saw it when I was at the gig. At the gig, right. and, I, and I did not see a hip hop movement though. Mm. I saw an alternative movement, mm. so that's why we push OAG hard. Uh, hip hop because I thought this uh, what uh, poetic ammunition at the time they were called poetic ammunition. What they did was really good, so I thought this should be out there, not knowing that there wasn't a market for hip hop yet. Right. I was too soon with poetic ammunition, mm. right. but when I when we did the album, then the market caught on, and when the market caught on and we became mass market, when too fat was released everybody went crazy mm-hmm. so meaning that we did help to break the hip hop market mm-hmm. but alternative market was already strong so we were just lucky to find an artist that helped us to break so that's why I'm, I'm today until today I'm very very grateful to OAG okay. and for that song 60 TV right, for, sure. not for that song I think right. I will be a really angry economist <laughs> <laughs> sitting in some library somewhere oh, getting okay. really upset myself so we are going to take a short break. When we come back, we will discuss more about the changes that happened in the music industry. Anything can happen Friday. The art and cultural site of Southeast Asia. Hello and welcome back to Durian ASEAN. You're still with Gauri and Grace. And of course, Isham is here with us uh, talking about the music industry in Malaysia. So for this uh, part, let's take it from, from where we left it off. You mentioned earlier how the music industry was quite uh, segregated or in box. Mm. Uh, how uh, has things changed right now? Do you still see that happening? Well, uh, to some extent, it is still happening. But right. at least uh, if, you have, you, if you have an act or if you are an act that is something a bit different, you have a chance because no nobody would just uh, you know uh, say that there is no hope for this kind of act because mm-hmm. it's proven. I think the most important thing we did was we we gave track record. We gave right. a uh, look. You, you can do kind of different kind of stuff and it can still work if you have this kind of blueprint. Okay. So that helped a lot of artists to try new stuff and that opened up a lot of I think record companies' eyes to try new stuff. All right. But uh, if I were to ask you, as, as an artist, mm. uh, let's say I, I'm a singer and I'm mm. trying to make it big, mm. do you, would you suggest that I sing in Malay, in English, or you would say that it doesn't matter anymore? It, I wish I can say it doesn't <laughs> matter, but it does. Okay. Um, mainly because uh, it, it does matter where, where if you want to reach big time mm-hmm. in Malaysia though, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. The Malay language is easier to, to cut through, right? Right. You can still do it in English and mm-hmm. still get away with it because mm-hmm. if you if you remember, Two Fat Big Ana Ayam was a song done entirely in English, mm-hmm. except the title is Malay, <laughs> right. right? Of course, then that song helped Two Fat, who was predominantly in English in the first album. Mm-hmm. They they were big, mm-hmm. but they were big in the in the scene where everybody liked the fact that it doesn't matter what language they are, right? right. That's fine. 
But mm. there is a big part of the market that that actually, if they don't understand, they're not going to listen to it. True. So when they crossed over into uh, the Malay market, they became even huger. There's no such word as huger. <laughs> yeah. They were they became bigger, <laughs> okay. and they became bigger, and suddenly everybody uh, listened to them. Everybody from from you know from the urban guys, mm-hmm. from the cool guys right. to the machis. Well, they all know too fat. Oh, okay. So I think if you want to be, it depends on your direction. Okay. If you all really want to take on the whole of Malaysia, you can do English, but you might find yourself resorting to Malay just to get everybody. Uh, right. okay. It depends on your point of view. If you are a Chinese artist who wants to break into China, then you have to do it Mandarin. In Mandarin, or right. I think Mandarin is the, the only <laughs> kind of language that can break through everywhere. Right? Yes. So, would you say it's more difficult to um, pursue your career in music in Malaysia than the other countries because of a lot of races and it's a bit more uh, segregated than the other mm. countries? Well, if you see yourself as being just in Malaysia, yeah. But if you see yourself as a citizen of the world, it's not... It's citizen not, of the world, yeah. Yeah, it's not... It's not it, you you got to see, where, where's your market? Mm-hmm. What are you trying to do? For example, like Zia B, mm-hmm. right? Her kind of music, of course, would not fly here so much because right. uh, it's a different style of music. Mm-hmm. So, of course, she had success uh, in America. Mm-hmm. Same with Yuna. Yuna. Mm-hmm. Yuna's style of music is not necessarily what you call very popular here, but but she has a, she's very popular, well, in, in, uh, in America. And she has some bigger degree of popularity in, in Malaysia. Malay so because she has songs that, that kind of crosses over both, mm-hmm. right? But so so you gotta see you you most most artists who come up and complain and to me and say that you know the kind of stuff they do because of Malaysia they can't really get a recognition and I said but you can't blame the Malaysian demographics mm. that is the demographic you can't force you can't right. go and strangle all the Pachi <laughs> and Machi to listen to your hip hop song right. because they are not yeah. going to yeah. right and there are more Pachi and Machis there are than there are hip hop listeners. So you just gotta get the fact that so you gotta know, right? Okay, so if you're a hip hop exponent and you wanna push hip hop in Malaysia, then you gotta think what can my hip hop be be also pushed to the hip hop fans in other countries? Mm. Whether it's Thailand, mm. it's it's Korea, it's America, then you have a collection of hip hop fans for you to push your hip hop music to. Mm. So it really depends on your mindset. Right. Now, the guys in America and and UK and Australia, people might think that they have it easy because if they hit the charts, yes. then they just, yeah. every, the whole world will listen to them. Yeah. Yes, but only 0.5% people hit the charts. Mm. For every Mariah Carey there is, there's a thousand more that didn't make it who sounds better than her. She just, was hap- she just happened to be in the right place at the right time with the right music, meeting the right people. <laughs> and she got it. And of course, she looks incredible, right? <laughs> so you need to have all that right. uh, and, and to be in the right place at the right time for you to make it big. So, uh, if you want to go into that route, mm-hmm. if you want to be a big English language act, you can make it out of Malaysia if somehow your music is so different and unique and just people, something mm-hmm. happened, fluke, you got it, right? Mm-hmm. Or you can actually do a lot of hard work by actually gigging in the States, mm-hmm. going from region to region and making a name for yourself and try to f- go up from that route in- instead. Mm-hmm. So, it really depends. Okay, and speaking of that, I'm quite curious uh, to know, uh, in terms of maybe yourself spotting mm. talent or uh, looking at a musician, uh, like you were saying earlier, it's not just about the talent, yeah. it's also about being at the right place, the right time, meeting the people. Mm. Uh, do you think that we have enough platforms here to do that uh, in terms of gigging and going out? Platforms, and yes. People? Spotters, mm. not, not enough. Okay. Well, last time we called them the A&R A- mm-hmm. man. Okay. The A&R man is an artist and repertoire What he does is he spot talents and go like I think this is going to be big right. You can't rely on the public The general public will only understand what they can see That is true Yeah. yeah. Which is why when people vote for artists in these reality shows yeah. The winners are always the safest one Because the right. general public does not understand the newer one But okay. if you give an A&R the chance to vote for a reality show He would vote for the one that he thinks will make the next year mm. Right. So he always looks uh. forward so good okay. A&R guys are like, for example, Colonel, Colonel Parker who found uh, Elvis Presley. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, George Martin who did the Beatles. They saw something right. and they pushed it forward. Okay. So what we have in Malaysia is we don't have enough of these guys who spot something okay. and push it forward. Right? So that, that I think that is the biggest uh, problem facing Malaysian 
industry. Okay. You mean like scouting the talents and scouting the, and know how to polish. I call it the polish. And the training, okay. <laughs> the polishers, they know right. like okay, this guy sounds like this right now, right? Mm. Okay, but you know what? If I did something with them, right. change the music, did a little bit of you know, right. spruced up something, yeah. boom, they can be big. Exactly. Yeah. I mean that's how in back in Korea also that's how it works, right? It all those uh, music uh, yeah. agency, they just go to shopping mall and then mm. they see they see like people gigging, yeah. and they will spot the talent and they will pick them up. Correct. And train and then sort of making making him or her as a product okay. but then after all they they become big after all right. yeah that's very true very yeah. true i think it's very interesting uh what you mentioned there uh so it's not really about just knowing what's current and you know who's uh doing good right now it's also about looking forward and uh sort of anticipating what's mm. what's next for mm-hmm. the industry yeah. as well tastes tastes do not regress yeah. tastes always move forward uh, when you've heard this album by Coldplay yes. you don't want to hear the same album the next time they do it you want to hear yeah. something new right. so everybody's moving ahead so if you're living in the past yeah. you'll just be left behind okay. so you got to figure out how to move ahead of them so when they come to your door mm. yeah, open arms with, and you, you're collecting the toll basically when they come okay. back right. so you got to think a little slightly ahead not too much ahead mm. slightly ahead and why do you think Malaysia this nation is uh lacking in terms of the sporters you call the there's not enough money in the music industry there because used to be more fans. sporters in the 80s and 90s right. call them the A&R guy mm-hmm. but when the music industry took a hit um, and all the money left and there was only money left I mean, you know the music industry is driven now by by ringtones and um, mm-hmm. some small advertising from streaming and iTunes maybe mm-hmm. But not a lot more physical physical stuff like CDs and stuff. Just not it's selling. getting lesser and lesser. It's, lesser. it's getting yeah. lesser and lesser, yeah. correct. So because of that, when there's less money in the music industry, you get some good people leaving. Right. Some start airlines, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some will go to yeah. TV. Yeah, I don't know, yeah. just people yeah. will just leave. And you, get, you are left with the distributor mm-hmm. and the talent. Now, if you have a distributor and a talent without a finisher in the middle, it's a hit and miss. The distributor will just take any talent. The talent thinks right. they are good. We, we, maybe they don't have... Because some, most, most creative people don't see... They are good, yes. But are they good for a sale? Mm-hmm. Right. So distributor just don't care. I Just give right. me what your stuff. I'm going to sell it, right? So mm. when, you don't, when you have that kind of like... A, throw everything to the wall and see what sticks approach. Mm-hmm. Then a lot of stuff will be cash and burn. Right? Mm-hmm. And there's no real development. But now we see it's coming back. Coming back. It's coming right. back because people are, uh, are seeing that there is there is hope. Okay. Right. In Malaysia. In Malaysian music, for it to be exported across the world. Right. Okay. okay. So when, with that belief, they're pushing harder. Mm. So do you think that uh, as an artist, it's okay to just focus in Malaysia, or would you encourage them to think regionally? Regionally. Okay. Think globally. You never know. You could have a big global hit. Now it's going to be extremely difficult, mm-hmm. but if you play your cards right, you know, you pay your dues, you go travel around the world, you see what's happening, then at least you'll have a shot. Okay. And also, um, nowadays, with the social media innovation, yeah. right, a lot of people do go to online platforms. Yes. You know, they upload videos and performance right. and such. Right. So, what is your perspective, thoughts in mm-hmm. these platforms when it comes to younger uh, generations? Right. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, younger generations with, with uh, limit, limited attention span. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, what you do is you need to get your music out there faster, shorter, and a bit more hype than usual, okay. right? You you can't build. You, you, that's how you get your 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 audience up and running very fast. But for you to sustain the long run, your music still needs to be very good. Right. You still need to have quality in it. Right. So, for example, Elizabeth Tan when she first started out, she did a cover of Joe Flizzo's Have All, mm-hmm. and she got famous from that, right? Um. So that's good. But she had to keep on going, come up with new songs and all that, and not just rely on that two minute, three minute thing that she did on YouTube. She's right. got to go and do full albums and then do a good, become a good artist, perform well enough monsters, do endorsements and all that. Then she'll have an actual career. So yeah, the U- YouTube and all the other uh, social media platforms are good to uncover, but for you to last, mm-hmm. you better have quality. Right. Okay. Yeah. You cannot fake it for too long. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll take another quick break when we come back. Maybe you can enlighten us more on what are, what are the sustainability factors that okay. an artist would need to sustain themselves. Yeah. 
Anything can happen Friday. The art and cultural site of Southeast Asia. Hello and welcome back to Duran ASEAN. You're still with Gauri here and Grace, and of course we still have Isham in the house with us today. And uh, for this part uh, of our Anything Can Happen Friday, we are going to discuss about what are some of the uh, important sustainability factors that uh, artists would need uh, in order to keep themselves going uh, in in the country or as an artist themselves. I think the biggest thing you need is actually uh, resilience. Okay. Uh, most, most than, more than anything, you will face a lot of uh, rejections. Mm-hmm. You will face a lot of failures. But those rejections and failures are very, very crucial for you to learn from and learn from fast. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people are saying this right now. You've got to learn how to fail fast so right. that you can get to the right solution faster. So I would suggest for that, for artists here to, be, to, be to, to not be afraid of rejection and go mm-hmm. for it and, and try Second one, after resilience, you've got to have belief in yourself. You've got you to know that what you've got is something that you believe, truly believe will make it. Mm-hmm. Without that belief, you know, you, you won't carry through yourself. Right? Mm-hmm. The third thing, you've got to do a reality check. Okay. Whether what you have going on with you is something that actually the industry does want, the market okay. does want. Do not ask your parents or friends what they think about their music. They will always say it's good. Yeah, for sure. Always play your demo to some guy waiting in front of you mm-hmm. in McDonald's. And okay. see what they say, you know. Mm-hmm. Then you get the actual, you know, or, or just play it for some bunch of guys. Say, hey, you know, I've heard about these artists, and see what they say. Don't tell them that it's you. Right. Then you will see the real reaction, and don't be sad because that is That's the paying reality. public. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No matter what you say, oh, public, they don't know what they're doing. But they are paying public, <laughs> so. You can make music for you and your five of your friends in Bangsa to listen to, but <laughs> that's about it. Then, yeah. then you really don't have a career. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't really have a professional career. You have what you call a, a career for yourself, mm-hmm. which is okay if you're happy with that. Mm-hmm. But most people want to see whether they can sell mm-hmm. the music across to many people. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying to sell out. I, I will never, ever, ever say to sell out. Okay. You've got to be true to yourself mm-hmm. and find out, is, is, do, do you have what it takes to sell? If, it, if not, can you do something to yourself? Train, you know, change, uh, change. I don't know, tweak your music, but don't change who you are. Right. You can't change who you are. Because if you're fake, then it will be very fast, you will get found right. out. Mm. So if, you, if that's who you are, that's who you are. And if you can sell, you, you will sell. If you can't sell, don't beat up yourself over it. Mm. You know, some people just not born to be artists. Maybe they were born to be A&R guys. Yeah. Maybe they were <laughs> supposed true. to be music lawyers. Right, Maybe yeah. they were supposed to be a music producer. Yeah. Right? So, so it's okay. It's, it's fine. It's just, it's just you don't have it. But mm-hmm. that's fine. So, so get that reality check. Okay. Done. So I think, I think if you have all this, you'll be okay. Also be aware of all the technological innovations that's happening mm-hmm. around you and what's, what's happening in social media. Um, and pay attention to the styles of music that's changing. Mm-hmm. Right, and always be, be ahead of everybody else if you can mm-hmm. I always say listen to the bands from the UK always. it seems that somehow ever since the 60s since right. the Beatles yeah. they've always been the forerunner oh, okay. of pushing the stars everybody in Malaysia says oh my god the Indonesian artists are so amazing the Indonesian mm-hmm. artists actually are copying the UK, UK artists yeah. The American artists are copying the UK artists. Okay. Those bands are there in UK. Yeah. I don't know why they feed them, but they just it's, <laughs> they just, just crazy. Everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> progressive. <laughs> just to make it easy, and of course, if you go out there and you start gigging in the UK, it's easier to break through because mm. it's a smaller market. Yeah. And it's easier to to yeah, break through. It's very true. Because everybody keeps yeah. thinking, I want to walk up the Grammy Awards. Yeah. <laughs> maybe that one would come to you later, maybe. But just you gotta get your steps right. That's mm-hmm. what I think. Mm-hmm. And. No, I wanted to ask you whether how about artists' mindset when it comes mm. to uh, making their own music? Because uh, if we want to talk about the indie music, mm. we are producing our own original stuff. Right, right. So with that, sometimes um, artists they manage uh, everything by themselves. Mm. So they can think uh, they may have talent and mm. they think like an artist, mm. but they may not have the, the the ability to think like businessman mm. or the. Uh, managing finance mm. and stuff so how would you advise I, I would always say always get a good manager always and it doesn't have to be your sister always find a good manager right. because as good as you are in both managing and in creativity it's always good to have someone to bounce ideas off okay. from you know keep your uh, you know check check and balance right mm-hmm. uh, plus it allows you to concentrate on your art Okay. You don't want to be bothered by by you know 
people. All these documents. And documents and, or yeah. even, uh, you know, res- restaurants calling the manager right. saying, when is the band coming? What time mm. was the... You really want to be left free to create. And everybody knows, all creators know that in order for you to create, you need to have some sort of respite from the world. You need to be away. You need to be detached. Yep. Mm. You can't say, I'm going to write a song at 4 p.m. and then have a meeting at 3. <laughs> you, you can't write a song at 4. Yeah, you finish yeah. a meeting at, at 4 and suddenly you find yourself, I've got one hour to write a song and nothing comes out. Right, God knows true. I tried it. Mm. For you to write a song at 4 p.m. on a Wednesday, your entire one week before that 4 p.m. and entire one week after that 4 p.m. needs to be entirely free. Right. So okay. for that to happen, for you to get the ideas running into your empty mind, mm-hmm. you got to get someone else to handle the business, no mm-hmm. matter how good you are at it. Okay. Right. Mm-hmm. Unless if you love the business so much, then, then you just you jump into that. Just jump to the business <laughs> and, and, yeah. and find an artist and nurture the artist. All right. Yeah. And I also want to ask you about some of the reality shows that mm-hmm. ATV has, of course, right. uh, come up with in the past. You brought um, Malaysian Idol, right. uh, then you also had One in a Million. Right. How has this uh, contributed to the local well, music? Well, I always say that the reality star is mm. a transient, uh, temporary TV star. Mm-hmm. TV helps you to get your face and name up in front of millions of people. Yeah. But whether you make it as an artist mm. will be depending on your album that comes out. Okay. So many people have this, this illusion mm. says that you're okay with Malaysian Idol, One in a Million or a- any other show out there yeah. that you will, we will look for the next star. I always say no, we are looking for the next TV temporary star. Right. <laughs> for That's a show. Wow. It's a reality. Yeah. Especially, especially the winners are always voted by the people. Yep. That's how you get interaction, right? Mm. Uh, with, the, with the engagement with the consumers and the viewers. Problem is as I said just now, people will only vote for things that they understand. Mm. The music industry doesn't work on things that you understand. It works on things that you might understand in the future. So right. there's always people take take risks with bands. They always mm. try risks with new acts. Mm. Because they don't know whether it's going to happen or not. But if it works, it's going to go boom. Which is why you get all these crash and burn reality stars. That mm. you think is so big, it's so amazing. Their voice is so amazing, right? Not realizing that amazing voice doesn't mean that you sell records right you can have a crappy voice and still sell records mm-hmm. it's that X factor right whether you have it or not and number two is is if the winner is a popular person that means he's popular right there and then which means that after a few months he's forgotten mm-hmm. normal unless the winner is someone or the, the contestant is someone that can always do something new all the time oh, right. then that will be okay mm-hmm. for example do you remember what happened to Taylor Hicks yeah <laughs> yeah he's gone right mm. because he was the most popular then but knowing that look at the talent you know that he's gonna get not gonna get far and people are always saying how come he didn't make it as an artist because he's a very good temporary TV star mm. so whenever I, d- I do these shows I always tell people just manage your expectations right especially the, the, the finalists right See, at the end of the show you'll be very famous but whether you make it or not as an artist depends mm. on the album Think, this show will just yeah. make you famous for the next two weeks before the next reality show comes in. So it's another sustainable thing that from artists to, to maintain their yeah. fame or even push further right. from there. Right. Mm. One in a million. First winner was Suki. Mm. Runner up was Faisal Tahi. Faisal Tahi, as you know, is way, way more mm. popular right yeah. now. Mm. Again, it's not about the person who won. It's about the talents in there. See who do you think will go further. And the general public will never be able to vote correctly because they only vote for what they understand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. If, the, if the Beatles went into a reality show, they would lose. Mm-hmm. If Michael Jackson went to a reality show, he would lose. Right? Okay. Everybody, <gasps> Mick Jagger would lose. Oh, yeah. Right? Because, they, you know, people say, oh, the voice is so amazing and big and, you know, I understand this music. But in the end... It's not about what you understand. But you still do out. go for public voting because of the interaction, isn't it? Public voting will get the ratings going up. So that's right. strictly a marketing ploy. Right. right. Okay. okay. Yeah. Do you actually personally talk to the artists and, and tell them this thing? Yeah, I, I told them, oh, guys, okay. you, you got to make the, your album after this. you got to make oh. s- good songs. Mm. Please don't get into your head that you become a star forever. Right. You're very lucky that you made it to the final. Mm-hmm. They're going to cheer for you. They know your name. But the next two weeks, if you've got mm. nothing out, they're going to forget you. That's true. That's very true. Mm-hmm. So speaking about the way forward in the music industry, mm. uh, I think we're almost at the end of our segment here. What are for some of your advice or what you would you like to say to budding musicians? Mm-hmm. I think don't give up. Mm. I think we are music is like this this big part of our culture, and if we give up, we will lose a big part of our culture. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I know the tough thing is to make money mm-hmm. because you need to, to to survive, right? But I said, don't give up and don't just think about that the only way you can make money is through selling records mm-hmm. or selling uh, streaming of your songs. Mm-hmm. You can always do gigs, you can always do corporate shows, you can always do events, you can always do endorsements, you can always go out of the country and do other things. So don't give up and, and always continue to surprise everyone with what you've got. So that's, that's the only thing I got to say. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, one last yep. thing. There's also a, a growing uh, indie music scene, uh, mm. I think, in KL, because mm. I'm actually from Penang. And back then, I wasn't familiar with much of the right. indie bands, indie music, but that seems to be quite popular uh, in KL. Mm-hmm. And do you think that uh, this helps uh, for, <coughs> like you were saying, out of 10 uh, people, one, one band might make it? Do yeah. you think that this could actually contribute in a positive As way? The more indie bands are out mm-hmm. there, the better chance we have that someone will make it because mm-hmm. they will spur each other on, you know. So I think having a, a scene that is slightly anti-establishment, uh-huh. slightly different from the norm, is always healthy okay. to push the norm. Okay. So because, for example, once once Too Fat went from fringe mm. into mass market, it pushed the mass market artists to try to become better or push to try to different uh, styles. Okay. And Too Fat themselves have to push themselves because they have then the anti as the anti mm. too fat kind of sound. Yeah. Who wants to make it big as well? Okay. Then too fat has to adopt that sound and for them to be relevant. It's a whole cycle. Right. right. Okay. Any more questions? No, um <laughs> pretty much very long long okay. during this interview. Uh, thank yeah. you so much, Isha, no for joining us for Thank an interview you. at Duran ASEAN.